Hey, you weirdos. I'm Elena. I'm Ash. And this is Morbid. Can I call you out for a second? Uh, yeah. In like a good way. It's like a silly thing. Anytime you do the Hey Weirdos, you outstretch your arms. I do. I really? Every single time do I do you me? hit record and you go, hey, weirdos. <laughs> and it's like you're like lifting them all. You're, you're kind of like a, a cult leader. Ooh, oh, I'm on theme today. You are. We're talking about a cult today. But that is, I didn't know that. I just watched you do it and I've like thought about it before, but not said anything. And I just had to say it. I kind of love that I do that and I, I didn't even realize it. yeah you're you're a cult leader and you didn't know I'm a it. cult leader and I had no idea that's that's look funny. at that I go that's funny that is funny <laughs> <laughs> um so what's everybody watching on tv anybody watching good tv out there Ooh, anybody um, are oh, you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I was watching um, The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And okay, I love The Housewives. And I know, I know the recipe. You get us super fucking hyped for an episode. And then all the goddamn, all the GD drama happens in the last five minutes. And they're like, wait for next week. And you're yeah, just like, I hate that. Ugh. So they've been really hyping up this um, fucking Aspen episode. And I was so excited. I'm watching it last night. All the end. All at the end. And now I'm dying to know what happens. And I just want to say, Team Sutton. Oh. I just want to say that. I'm I'm a Beverly Hills, like, I've gone in and out. Yeah, you haven't I haven't been in, Girl. but I know Sutton. And, yeah. I, and I'm, I'm interested to see why your team Sutton. I feel like Sutton is one of my souls. Honestly, Sutton is getting, like, bullied this season to the That's point where cool. it's actually hard to watch. That happens a lot on these shows. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because when you watch it, like at a certain point, I think we've all kind of maybe it's like the internet or something. We've all kind of reached a point where we're like, oh yeah, that's not cool. Like yeah, all of a no. sudden you're just like, oh shit. Like what I thought was fun drama before, you're like, mm, yeah, that's really mean and actually. There's still like fun drama. Like yeah, I love course. the fun drama, but sometimes but there's an it, element. Yeah, and sometimes it just gets tea. I love that this is a housewives podcast. Yeah, at you this know, point. I, I would fucking love that. <laughs> um, but sometimes it just gets taken to a point where you're like. Too far. Yeah. Like, I don't, too far. I don't need to watch that. Not like, fun. I don't want to watch Sutton crying because somebody's calling her a cunt. Like, yeah, sometimes, I don't want to watch that. Sometimes there's parts of reality shows where you're like, I feel weird that I'm being allowed to watch this. Yeah. Moment. Like, I don't think I should be allowed to watch this moment. And I'm maybe it's like it comes with age or something that you're maybe just like, I'm not what gaining the same kind of entertainment that I gained from watching somebody be upset about something yeah. it's just not what i'm into anymore. because a lot of people are talking about like i don't want to like say names but there's like some like th- honestly there's so much drama going on on tiktok and i know one person is like breaking down on tiktok oh, and yes. everyone's talking about it and i'm like we're not supposed to watch people break down on the internet yeah it's you're not really supposed not. to watch that for like entertainment value yeah it just really is one of those things that like there's no way, and I I saw somebody talk about it that there's no way the human brain was made. Yeah, it was a guy that was taking a break from TikTok. Yeah, to just like scroll through and watch somebody like going through cancer treatments and like losing their you know their loved one to this horrible disease, and like you watch their story and you get so upset and you cry, and then you scroll five seconds later and you're watching someone do a dance that makes you laugh, and then you scroll again and right. it's somebody's dog on their last day of life eating delicious food, and you scroll again, and it's like yeah. Yeah. There's no way our brains are, and I know we're like, fuck the internet right now, but like, <laughs> Aren't we it's always? getting to a point where it's just like, ugh. Like, I love TikTok. I fucking love TikTok. My TikTok is a very, it's my For You page is a fun place. Mm-hmm. It, honestly, mine is really all happy. It's just making me laugh mm-hmm. and like making and giving me like thought provoking things. And a lot I of don't have things. a lot of sad. Oh, a lot of stranger things. I have a lot of Eddie Munson on my <laughs> For You page, which is fine with me. But it's a lot of like I don't get any of the sad stuff. I think because I'm like I'm not interested. <laughs> like, you're not you interested. actually go and click Literally. the not interested button. But like it's true that there's just like a lot of uh, 
there's a lot of like I've seen a lot of creators that are having a, like a really hard time right now and I hope yeah. everybody's doing okay like one of my favorite creators and I know you really love her too Michaela yeah. I mean you just have to say Michaela period. oh yeah on TikTok like people are being awful to her and I'm like ha she just seems like that like I don't know her personally but she is a Gemini so like boom <laughs> but and she's a Boston girl and she's a Boston girl with like a full-blown Boston yeah. accent kid. she's the best but how are you being mean to her? All yeah. she wants to do is, is bring show joy. You, show you how to do your fucking makeup like a boss. Yeah, she's just bringing joy. And it's just like, I don't know. It's easy from another position to be like anybody talking shit at somebody like that is clearly a very unhappy person. Mm -hmm. And that's where they get their positive little jollies out is by taking someone else into their darkness with them and then even that makes me sad to but a that's, degree see that doesn't make me sad because i'm like get the fuck off the internet if oh, that's yeah. what you're doing but i'm like it, it's easy for someone else you can say it to someone else it's easy to look in on some other creator and be like i promise you this is what these people are right but when it when it's happening to you it's like that's you can't see that right you can't see through it and it's just all encompassing and when i watched her videos like guys follow her because she's fucking amazing yeah. and because she does amazing makeup and she's just a a god she's a joy she's a she's light a joy she, she really that's is that's the thing like i feel like <laughs> i've been meditating so much lately and <laughs> i know good. that i'm fucking crazy and we're also gonna get like into meditation in this episode <laughs> there you go we're just we're teeing up this episode <laughs> is what we're doing but i feel like i'm just thinking a lot more about like light and yeah. like the light inside of people and like what people project out into the world and i'm not like i'm not just like saying light i'm just saying like <laughs> who you are and like karma and all that stuff and i just don't understand why when people see somebody shining so fucking brightly you have to take it upon yourself to try to tear that down that and that's the i i think we've all like the internet is a scary place and it brings out the worst in people it also brings out the best in people like the con kid that's it so it's like there's some really great things and it's like i wish everybody would just lean more that way of like lifting people up yeah and we've all like you know everybody's had moments where you've been a dick and of it's course. like worse and it's like but just it's okay it's fine just grow right just grow as a person when she's because i think you and i are we've been saying it a lot we've been saying it for the last like couple of years i think on this podcast mm -hmm. that we're just like you know what i just decided it's just like not i don't i don't find joy in watching you know public breakdowns no. and shit. it's just not something i like to it's like I remember when, like, Amanda Bynes, when that whole thing was happening, mm -hmm. everybody was watching it. Mm -hmm. And we all were. We Us all included. Were. I was going to say, I was I watching was that. Say, and I look back now and I'm like, that wasn't funny. No. Like, that wasn't funny. It's just like, I know it was like, we, it's so fun. It's weird to see the difference when you start growing and Even looking at that stuff. Like, how different you can feel about a situation. It's growth. And it's like, when you, I just, I want everybody just to, like, that's why I've, I just want to, like, you know, shout out podcasts and, like, shout, like, tell you to go listen to these things and go read these books because, like, let's just fucking lift cool people up. Right. And that's the thing, all. Like, the thing is, it feels good. If you're putting hate out into the world, you're getting it back. Yeah. That's it's why you're happen. miserable. That's and why you're unhappy. You got to start speaking good shit into existence. It's true. You got like, you don't compliment somebody because you want something out of it. No. But like, do it because it feels good. And it does. It really does. It does. It feels a lot. Everybody talks shit with their friends. Of we course. still talk shit. Like, I'm you know a Gemini. I mean? Of course I'm out here talking <laughs> we're shit. We're not sitting there being like, don't say anything mean about anybody. No, of course no, you can not. Talk shit with your friends, whatever you yeah. want. I think it's when it goes public and when like it just becomes this bullying thing. Like when I saw Michaela so upset, it just, I was like, dude. Yeah. And I've seen so many creators like that lately. And, like some of them are leaving TikTok and stuff. And I'm like, man, And that's the other thing. I'm like, you are going to sit here, all these haters and like comment mean shit on this video, but then you're going to be the first person pissed off when that person is like, I'm not creating anymore. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, just remember that there's humans behind there. Like, and we're not talking about it. Like the, we're not even talking about, we're ourselves. not even talking about ourselves. I'm honestly, talking about you guys are fucking awesome. <laughs> you guys are honestly, we have a great community. Like I, I talked about like the book unbox the other day and you guys like literally made me have like almost tears like if I was a human I would have had tears in my eyes right because I, <laughs> I was also reading. um I just have to like say this because like one one positive positive to another positive positive this bitch's waist was snatched <laughs> in that video I like you look beautiful your face is gorgeous but, like I got that goes without saying and I'm so happy you wrote a book but oh your god. your waist was snatched <laughs> I was like oh my god look oh at this god. girl thank you you're welcome it was the jeans no really it was it's you 
I appreciate that. It's you that. wearing the jeans. The jeans weren't wearing you. You know what? You look fucking phenomenal and your lashes are to die. Oh my God, go to Slaley Taylor. <laughs> the fact that I, I, Kaylee's like, you've been shouting me out on the podcast so much lately. I'm like, I know. You're like, I love you. I know. It's, it's, it's due. It's women supporting women. That's right. That women bitch, supporting women. That bitch put glitter eyelashes in my eyelashes. See? For a concert that I'm going to. Everybody's great. I love life. But you guys are seriously fucking awesome. And we just like, we got to like give you pats on the back because you make us happy. Yeah. And you make us excited to make you content. And you guys rule. You really and do. And that's why when you see like other creators having like so many issues, I'm like, oh no, can I give you some of my, it, it, my amazing community? Like that's, and that's why I wanted to, because I'm like, you guys are so fucking amazing. Yeah. And you lift us up all the time. So I'm like, can you, here you go. Give some <laughs> of that love to like other people too. Like, yeah. Because you guys are just fucking awesome. Like you were so sweet on that unboxing video and like i just want to hug you all yeah. like just and i don't even like hugs i fucking hate hugs so we're, we're both not huggers even like i i didn't know what to caption my picture the other day and i would just been thinking lately that i want more tattoos so i just made it i need some more tattoos tattoos and so many of you guys were like i'm a tattoo artist here like i would love to tattoo you yeah, you're like, just cool you, like that's cool yeah, like that's just spreading awesome. awesome yeah you just you guys are great and i just we just we want to let you know whenever yeah. we can how fucking great you are and that we appreciate you. Right now, we're love bombing you because we want you to join a cult. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but we are going to talk about a cult, and we should probably get into it now because that was kind of like my attempt at a segue. So there you go. So you know, this we we just brought it old school for a second with like a 10 minute tangent in the beginning. Yeah, it's... but I thought it was important. It's just talking about like everybody be everybody be psyched. Yeah, exactly. So I'll just high five each other and, li- and tell each other good job. Great job. You're doing even. great today. You're, you look great. You look great. You're going to have a great day today. And if anybody feels like shit right now and you're having like a bad day, you're going to have a fucking great day. Make you it you oh. look great. You know what? I can tell from over here that you smell great. You do smell very good. You are projecting wonderful vibes. You're having a wicked good hair day. You're having an amazing hair day. Your face is radiant. And you know what? Yeah. You're, you're a wonderful human inside. And, and your I coffee or tea or beverage of choice today oh, gonna is going to be so good. Um... What was I going to say? I was going to tell you something else about yourself. Wow. Wow, that just flew right out of Maybe my head. Maybe it'll pop in your head randomly in the middle of the episode. Oh, I, it's back. <clears throat> there it is. Our principal from high school. Oh, yeah. Make it a great day or not. The, the choice, choice is, is yours. yours. There you go. All right. So <laughs> let's get into the story. <laughs> now that you, we've you no know vibed all over you. <laughs> uh, it's, all, it's a whole bunch of woo, so it was really on brand. It's really on brand. <laughs> didn't realize I do is like I am one of those people where I eat my stress away so if I've realized it lately because I've been a lot more stressed but if I'm really really stressed out I'm filling my face at a rate that is just I can't even talk to you about but ever since I've used Noom I kind of started realizing that I was doing that and you know realizing something just gets you one step closer to kind of like rectifying that situation and the Noom weight app has some of the nicest coaches on the planet and once I realized this was something I was doing I talked to my coach about it and she was like all right so what you're going to do is you're going to sit there and try to figure out am I eating because I'm stressed or am I eating because I'm hungry and kind of differentiating between the hunger cues and that's why I love the new weight app because there's no judgment involved like they're just people and they're just trying to help you with their psychology first approach, Noom Weight empowers you to build more sustainable habits and behaviors. And let me tell you, once you realize again what you're go- what's going on in your in your psychology up here in your brain, those habits are going to be so much easier to change. The behaviors are going to be so much easier to change. And the thing is, every journey is different. So your daily lessons are maybe not going to be the same as mine because they're personalized to you and your goals. This program is based on scientific principles like cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which is literally the therapy that I actively do. And then I'm actively doing it on Noom because it helps me understand my relationship with food. Here's the thing too, whatever your health goals are, because again, everybody's are going to be different, but the flexible, non-restrictive program that that Noom uses focuses on progress instead of perfection. And that's something that I think is so much different than other apps out there. You can choose your level of support. You could have a five-minute daily check-in. You could have personal coaching, whatever you want. And progress is not a straight line. Off days are totally okay. Noom Weight's going to help you get back on track. 95% of customers say that Noom Weight is a good long-term solution. And active Noomers, that's what they call us, lose an average of 15 pounds in 16 weeks. 
Noom Waits approach is grounded in science, which I think that's what I really like about it. It just kind of makes sense to me because it's very black and white. They've published more than 30 peer-reviewed scientific articles that inform users, practitioners, scientists, and the public about their methods and effectiveness. Break the cycle with motivation and support from Noom Waits' psychology-based approach. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com slash morbid. That's n-o-o-m dot com slash morbid to sign up for your trial today. All right. Well, today's story, honestly, it has like a little bit of everything. We've got we've got true crime. Ooh. We've got murder acquittals. Ooh. We've got yoga. Uh, of course. And astrology. Oh, wow. And most importantly, there's cults. Of course. Um, I do have to give a little shout out to my friend, not Kaylee, but Kayla. Uh, we were talking a couple weeks ago about how we would have absolutely mistakenly joined a cult back in the 70s. Definitely would. And Kayla was like, Ash, like you always say you would have gotten on the bus with Charlie Manson. Unknowingly, of course. Of course. And she was like, I don't know if that's the cult we would have ended up in. I think we might have ended up in the Source family. Wow. So that's what I'm going to be talking about okay. today. So I start looking into this. Like, she's like, oh, there's this documentary. It's literally called The Source Family. I think it's on Amazon for free. There's commercials, though. But um, <laughs> it's okay, though. I know how you guys feel about commercials. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I was like, I started looking into this. I'm like, I have to cover this on Morbid. Because I think the last cult that I did, personally, was the Blackburn cult. Wow, and, and that was one of my favorite episodes you've done. Oh, thank you. That was also that was a long time when ago. we discovered fucking Johnny and Tyler from that spooky. <gasps> oh my god, yes. Because they had covered it, and I listened to their episode after to like, I was like, ooh, like maybe did I get everything, you know? Ooh. And then I listened to their episode, and I said, these boys are great. I love them. I love them. And then she told me, she said, that's spooky. You gotta listen to it. And I said, no. ooh. They're on a fucking network. And they're the best. Yeah, I we think love them. I think we're gonna go do like a collab with them in the next yes. couple of months. So check um, your eyes out for Yippee. that. Don't check your eyes out. But yes, um, and I also, then I saw some of you suggest this case. Okay, so we're, we're with all that being said, <laughs> all of the fucking shit, we got to get into the Source family cult. And it all begins with a man named James Jim Edward Baker. Yes. Okay. So there is really limited information on his early life. There's limited information on this case all around, but... I did some newspapers.com action oh, and we love newspapers.com. It just helps you like piece the puzzle together. Yeah, it's not an ad. We just genuinely like this is organically. We just fucking love newspapers.com. I truly do. So I was able to find out that Jim was born in Cincinnati, Ohio on July 4th, 1922. Oh, the roaring 20s. I, that's what I was literally going to say. So his father left when he was really young and he was raised primarily by his mom, Cora, which really pretty name mm. now from a young age he was super fascinated with health and wellness and he ended up growing up in the same neighborhood as paul bragg do you know who paul bragg is that sounds very familiar you're gonna realize it because i realized it and i was like i literally have his shit in my cabinets oh you probably don't but it's a little woo oh, so okay. <laughs> that only put like growing up in the same uh neighborhood as paul bragg only put more of an emphasis on jim's fascination because paul bragg actually became very well known over the years as kind of like an alternative health food uh advocate okay and he believed he had like these wild beliefs for back then that in order to lead a healthy lifestyle which it's going to sound funny now because these are things that i think a lot of people kind of implement into their lives now fasting like i know a lot oh, of people yeah. are into intermittent fasting he was all about that he was about no meat like avoiding meat and having a regular exercise routine yeah which we're not saying any of these things are things you should do or no. not or not do no i literally your, don't have a regular choice. exercise yeah. routine um and i never fast yeah it's a, do do what you want to do and talk to a doctor first exactly. so he was also one of the first people to make juicing popular oh. and eventually he would go on to have his own brand and it all started with apple cider vinegar Oh. Bragg's apple cider vinegar. Oh, okay. Um, he thought that it had like really revitalizing ingredients that would promote a healthy gut and had all these, these other like health benefits. People love an apple cider vinegar moment. They do. I don't know a lot about apple cider vinegar, but I do know that it helps with my heartburn. And then I realized that the soy sauce alternative that I use is actually Bragg's brand. Oh, that's funny. Just sitting in my cabinet this whole that's time. That's wild. 
It's called Liquid Aminos. Um, but he was also one of the first people to open a health food store. I think it was opened in 1912. Wow. And it primarily, it, it was kind of like a, like a Whole Foods Trader Joe's kind of place. But anyway, Paul became a really big part of Jim's life. And he really became like a father figure because remember, his father just up and left. So they would go hiking together all the time. And they'd, you know, Paul was talking to Jim about this like alternative health lifestyle. And Jim was already interested. So I think that kind of planted the seed early on yeah and i think it's where a lot of jim baker's foundation came from and he would later take his conversations with paul bragg and other people and different things he learned through his own studies of health and wellness to open his own health food stores and restaurants but he had a few things to do before he got there so when he was 12 years old he was apparently named america's strongest boy oh just casual that's a thing <laughs> i don't know if it what? still is anymore i don't know if you can like sign your boy up for that but sign your boy up sign your boys up for the america's strongest boy contest <laughs> what's the age range there great question yeah <laughs> i didn't look too much into it because i was that's just like totally fine wow cool <laughs> yeah i'm uh, good knowing just that amount of information i'm glad uh he he took that though he took that title and ran with it hell yeah because as he was growing up he was like really active he took archery lessons he played different kinds of sports but the main thing that really spoke to jim was judo yeah uh, you know yeah of course um it's unclear where exactly his mother worked i really tried to figure out where she was working and i couldn't but she was said to have worked with an inmate so i'm assuming like some kind of like prison system um and this inmate was a judo master before he became incarcerated and hmm. this judo master was the one to teach jim all about it Okay. And then Jim basically became a judo master. Like, wow. Through the teachings of this man. It's very karate kid. Very. Very now, once, wax on, wax off. Oh my God, I wanted to write that. <laughs> and then I was like, is that too silly? No. Never. So once he became somewhat of his own judo master, Jim, he either enlisted or he was drafted into the Marines just in time for the start of World War II. Oof. And he was in the front lines. Like he, he saw hand-to-hand -hand combat, they said. And he was said to bring home a silver star for his courageous behavior after a ship that he was on was attacked. Um, I will point out that his name doesn't appear on the list of men who did bring home silver stars over hmm. the years. So the thing about Jim is like... <clears throat> He becomes a cult leader, spoiler alert. So he's so, a tall tale teller. He's a tall tale teller. And then all over the years, like his followers have heard these stories and it's like a game of telephones. Of course. So you don't really know what's true and what's not all yeah. the time. That's a requirement for being oh, a cult leader. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry if you just heard my chair squeak. I had to readjust. But so, yeah, I didn't see his name on that list. But if you do watch the documentary, the Source Family documentary, they um, flashed this newspaper headline and I paused and unpaused a million in time so I could read it and basically it said that Jim was aboard the ship called the Chicago and it was attacked and he seemed to like fight off the enemy and then hit the ship that he was on sunk and he floated in the water for hours I guess waiting to be picked up and that was all while he was still in training wow allegedly Allegedly. So he, he has a time in the war. He, he does some wild, crazy stuff. Yeah. And then he comes home and he gets married to this woman named Margaret and they have a daughter named Peggy. And Jim is trying to adjust to family life and he opens up a fitness center that he named after himself. It was called Baker's Gym. But that really only lasted a short while because a main theme in this story is that Jim was always looking for his purpose. Like yeah. he, he never felt like he was fulfilling his purpose. Yeah. So he was like, I don't know. I feel like there's out there. There's more out there for me. So he kind of like um, William Desmond Taylor's it and abandons his wife and child to go oh. find what's out there for him. So he's a shithead. Yeah, That's exactly. Good. I also love that he did Baker's Gym because his name is Jim Baker. Yeah, yeah. That is fun. It's also like, would you go to Baker's Gym? No. Do they have cookies there? Probably not. I hope so. <laughs> It's like when Planet Fitness used to give out the free pizza, and I'd be like, isn't this kind of counterintuitive? But it's like, nah, fuel up. I love pizza. Fuel up for so your workout. I would go for the free pizza all the time, and then I'd be like, oh, I, I'm going to hop on this machine for four minutes. Bye. Yeah, there you go. You did a workout. Yeah, four minutes is great. It's more than zero. It's more than I'm doing right now, so... You moved your shoulders. That's exercise. There you go. <laughs> so, so he ends up, so he leaves. He abandons his family, his cool. young baby child. It's fun. And he ends up where everybody goes when they're trying to find themselves. Say it with me. Ooh, California. Los <laughs> yeah, it worked out. <laughs> you, we were on the same page. We were there. <laughs> was, as soon as it came, I was like, whoops, she saved the whole state. I forgot. Okay. 
that, that really worked out. So he tried acting for a bit, obviously. Of course, um, that's what you do when you abandon your family. Always got to go for the acting. He screen tested for the role as Tarzan, but um, he didn't make the cut. I think this was before he grew all, or it was before he grew all of his hair. So I guess I get it. He didn't have a long flowing mane. He didn't and have the mane. That's not Tarzan brand. So. No way. So he was like, all right, that didn't work out. So then he was like, you know what I'll do? I think I want to become a stuntman. Yeah. So he tried his hand at that. Unclear, really, how that turned out. It doesn't seem like too much came of it, though. And um, there was still more that Jim felt like he should be doing. He, yeah. He didn't know what it was, but he was like, I don't, like, none of this is right. It doesn't feel right. So while he's trying to figure out his life's purpose, he opens up a sandal shop. Okay. That's, That's the obvious next step yeah. in your life's journey. I, he was, like, uh, good with leather. Like, he was, like, a leather worker. So I think it was, okay. like, how he made the sandals. Sweet. And he starts making sandals for this group called the Nature Boys. Okay. I had never heard of the Nature Boys. Had you? No. They're apparently faint, like, like famous, like, well-known. Oh. So... Uh, Jim would like make shoes for them and they also would like hang out on the beach because they lived off the land. So the nature boys, they wore like white robes and sandals. They only ate fruits and vegetables and they lived off of like very little money. Okay. They lived, like I just said, strictly outdoors and all about living off the land. So one of the nature boys, one of the very first, his name was Ibn Abez and he wrote the song Nature Boy that Nat King Cole later made famous. Oh, okay. It's actually like a really beautiful song. I love it. Um, Just like a little aside about him, I started reading more about him as soon as I got into this. One of his main uh, main beliefs was to give love and receive love is the greatest gift that one could ever get or give in life. Yeah, just ask you and McGregor in Moulin Rouge. Oh my gosh. When they play Nature Boy and they... And he says that exact thing. I haven't seen that movie in so long. Yeah. And now I want to watch it. He says to love and be loved is the greatest thing of all. It is. Yeah. And that's what Eben said. You um, said it too. He did also believe that no human should capitalize the first letter in their name or the uh, like their last name, like no capital letters in your name, because God and infinity were the only two things that were worthy of that much honor. I'm glad you explained that because my next question was going to be like, why though? Yeah, because you're not worthy of that. I mean, I'm doing it. So. Yeah. Well, I don't Whoops. know if you're worthy. So. Sorry. I don't know. I mean, I'm also doing that. Yeah. I'm going to continue to. You should. Yeah. I like it. So all that to say that Jim would really start to think a bit more about his conversations with the nature boys and then think back to his conversations with Paul. And I think the holistic, natural way of life really, really started speaking to him because he's getting older now. He's like nearing his 30s. Yeah. So by the time he's decided to act on those beliefs by opening his very own natural food restaurant, he had met and married another woman. I love, by the way, that you said he's getting older now, nearing his 30s, like I'm Any sorry. twenty year old is old. <laughs> <laughs> like that was wild. I'm really sorry. You're like he was like twenty seven. Like <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was feel wild. I feel very old. And you I'm are, only twenty six. <laughs> I'm not, but I feel it. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to points. interrupt you. I just that was wild. How dare you? Well, it's, I did insult you a little bit, so like I, I do apologize. <laughs> Thirty-year-olds, fine. I do apologize, elder millennials. It's okay. I feel fine about it. Thir- I can't wait to turn thirty. Turning thirty is great. I think you figure a lot out in oh, your thirties. Yeah. I think that I'm like approaching it a little sooner than like I would because I got you. Yeah, your thirties is definitely when you're like, oh, that's how things work. Okay. Yeah, I'm starting to feel that way. Yeah. But yeah, so he he he's old and. Yeah. <laughs> He's an old 20 year old. He meets another woman. He marries her. Her name is Elaine. Beautiful name. And um, so he does all that. And also by the time he opened his restaurant, he had um killed a man. Oh, yeah. No. You heard that right. We what? went from like a lot of peace, love, health, hippie wow. ideals. And then we just went boom, yeah. just straight up murder. That came out of nowhere. Was it murder, though, Elena? Or was it self-defense? You decide. I don't know. I wasn't there. Well, you weren't there, but also I'm going to tell you about it. So like maybe you can make an inference. Cool. All right, cool. I love the word inference. That's a great word. So the year was 1955 mm-hmm. and oh, he's 33. Yeah. So 33 year old Jim Baker was living in Topanga Canyon. Top- Thank you. Uh, He had a neighbor that he was friendly enough with. This guy's name was Edward A. 
Bollinger, I believe. Uh, Edward was a mechanic, and Edward had a dog named Candy. But yep. he, I love that. So I was much. like, yep, he did. <laughs> Correct. But he had run into a bit of trouble with the law. I, it seems like he was driving with a suspended license. I don't know. Or he was. I don't know if there were like previous charges that basically he had to go to jail. He was going to be spending some time in the big house. Oh, no. And because of that, he was like, I'm going to be gone, but like, I can't bring candy with me, obviously. Like, do not let you bring your puppy to jail. Nope. So he said, hey, Jim, would you mind watching candy while I'm gone? Like, would you take her in? And Jim's like, yeah, no problem. He takes the dog in. Edward heads off to jail. I think it was a short stint because he, you know, hadn't killed anybody. Yeah. But when he gets back, he's fucking pissed at Jim. Oh, no. Because he finds out that Jim wasn't letting Candy stay inside at night. Oh, no. He was, like, keeping her tied up outside, which I know some people do, um, you know. No judgment. No. Um, but but Edward had judgment. Yeah. And it was his, his dog, dog, so he, he can. Say. Exactly. He was pissed. He was like, what the fuck? So this big fight ensues and Edward en- ends up dead. Oh, no. And the way that Jim later explained it, he said he explained to the San Bernardino County Sun, that newspaper, what happened. He said, Edward was, quote, incensed and kept screaming at me. Suddenly, he spun around and I caught a glimpse of metal. Without even thinking, I grabbed his arm in a judo hold and hurled him over a 20-foot embankment. What? He survived. He still had his knife in his hand when he started to get up again. I, le- I leaped at him and he and used another judo hold. I meant to disarm him, not to kill him. So oh. that's what he says happened. And okay. when the police arrived on scene, they did find Edward's body right next to an eight inch hunting knife. And okay. Jim's wife, Elaine, was there. She corroborated the story, Jim's story. So he ends up getting off of murder charges and the attack was attributed to self-defense. Oh, my. So he has killed one man. Oh, man. Um, Yeah. Now, I found a couple of interesting tidbits in that San Bernardino County Sun article, too. One of which was Jim explaining to the interviewer that his father was a Chicago detective who was killed by gangsters. Literally Uh, any other source I could find about his father said that he just left when Jim was still a baby. So I think I think that was a little fib. That was a little cult leader moment. Yeah, I think he was just embellishing. And then the other tidbit is almost like a little bit of foreshadowing for something later in the story. So I'm just going to have I'm going to tell you right now and you can hold on to it. You can uh, put it in your back pocket. Woo. The article mentions that Jim won a world judo championship in 1948 against opponent Wild Bill Zim of Argentina. Wow. Like, how could I not tell you that? Yeah, you got to tell us that. He wins the championship against win, Wild Bill Zim. You win anything against a Wild Bill or a Wild anything for yeah. that matter. A Wild Thornberry. You've, even. you've earned it. Yeah, but he so he wins that, and he says, quote, However, that was my last match. I collapsed with a broken back right after the match. Oh. I was hospitalized for more than six months from the injury. It's a very deadly weapon, referring to judo, but now I wish I had never heard of it. Oh. You heard it here first. That was certainly not Jim's last judo match, and it's very interesting that he broke his back at one point in his life. That is very interesting. He'll come back later. Uh-oh. gosh when i look at pictures of my skin back in the day i'm like girlfriend what the heck were you using on your face i'm not gonna call it any brands but like some of the ones that i found out about i'm like ooh, i probably shouldn't have been putting that on my face but what i will put all over my face is curology's customized skincare i am absolutely obsessed with curology i've now been using it for two years i mean i heard about curology on podcasts all the time and i was like yeah like i'm yeah i don't know about that but then we got sponsored by curology and i finally got a chance to use it and omg it works so beautifully curology is game-changing custom skincare made for you by a dermatology provider they'll create a custom prescription cream for your specific goals whether that's tackling acne clogged pore skin texture spots dark spots fine lines or anything else something else you start by taking a short online skin quiz and uploading photos and then if it's a good fit they'll ship your formula right to your door and it even has your name on the bottle and you guys know exactly how i feel about that The thing that I love about Curology is it's not just like a bottle that's made for everybody that they just ship out like to everybody and anybody. You get a specific formula based on all of your issues or things that you want to tackle, your personal skincare needs. 
over time, I have noticed, like, obviously, you know, I, I do be getting the Botox, but I don't get it everywhere. And my cheeks were kind of like looking liney to me a couple years ago. Now that I've been using it, I, I don't know. I just don't see those lines anymore. And I feel like my skin has this like glowy, beautiful texture to it. Am I just like hyping myself up right now? Yes, but Curology also was too. I also get their daily moisturizer. It's super lightweight. It's something you can totally use in the summer, but also in the winter because it really is very nourishing as well. It also like smells delicious. Delicious. I really love it. And the thing that really surprised me the most about Curology is I thought this was going to be like 95 steps. It was going to be super hard to implement into my routine. Like that's just been my experience in the past. No, this is a super easy thing to add into your routine. It takes maybe two and a half minutes every morning. That's it. Get started with Curology just like I did with a free 30-day trial at Curology.com slash morbid. Just pay $5 for shipping and handling. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash morbid to start your free 30-day trial. Cancel anytime. Prescription subject to consultation. So with all that, you know, murder all for now murder. behind Jim, he decided that he was going to focus on making improvements to his life. Yeah, of course. He and his wife decided together that they were going to open a restaurant and that it was going to be one of the first of its kind in the California area. So their plan was to serve like super organic, whole foods, very health conscious. And they decided that they were going to name the place the Aware Inn. Cool. Were they, was he going to invite his old family to come? Yeah, I don't or... think so. No, no. Okay. I think Just checking. I think Peggy and Margaret um, said de- decline that you. invitation. Yeah, I think they were like, "I'm good. We're going to go eat cheeseburgers together because yeah, you left us, and that's comfort food." Fuck so, that. the original Aware Inn uh, opened up in 1957 at 8828 Sunset Boulevard, and there were like quotes painted on the walls that said things like, "Food should be selected with confidence, eaten with pleasure, and digested with ease." Yeah, like so motivational. And from the start, actually, the Aware Inn was a huge success. A lot of celebrities were going there to order carrot juice, hoping that it would restore their youth or something. For sure. And there's a misconception that uh, the Aware Inn only served vegetarian food. They didn't. They served meat. Oh. Um, there were dishes like burgers, beef stroganoff, things like that. So they had a little bit of everything, but it was a health conscious way of doing it. Okay. In their opinion. Uh, So with the Aware Inn becoming so popular so quickly and with the business bringing in a really good amount of money, the baker said, you know what, let's open a similar restaurant down the street a little bit. And they opened up this restaurant and it was called The Old World. I like the names. I do like, yeah. I there like was that one. there ended up being another one called the Discovery Inn. Like Ooh. they're just like fun. They're pretty good at like those like adventury. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. So this restaurant, the Old World, had pretty much all the same values that the Aware Inn had, just with like a slightly different menu, and it was a little farther down Sunset Boulevard. All was well and fine. Business was booming. The bakers even had a couple kids by now. I think they had two. But Jim still wasn't satisfied yeah he can't get no satisfaction no he can't now it appears during this time he had at least two affairs on his wife the first that we're going to talk about uh actually ended up with jim killing another man oh yeah so one of the actresses that frequented his restaurants and hung out with the beat on the beach with him from time to time Ooh. was Jean ingram okay uh she's best known for movies throughout the early 60s i don't know if any of these sound familiar to you or anybody listening uh she was in three came to kill in 1960 burke's law in 1963 and sergeant deadhead in 1965 oh that sounds familiar the, the last one sounded familiar to me yeah. as well uh but back to 1963 for a second because that is when jim actually killed Jean's estranged husband over his restaurant, The Aware Inn. Wow. Yeah, wonderful, huh? Okay. So from the sounds of the setup, there was an apartment above the restaurant. And on January 29th, 1963, Jean's husband, Robert, showed up while Jim was at his apartment. And Robert demands that Jim shows him where Jean is hiding. He's like, I know she's in here. I know what's going on between the two of you. Oh, no. You have fought, like, well, let, me not, let me not tell you the whole thing right away. Jean honestly very well could have been coming and going to that apartment, and I don't doubt that Robert probably did see her venture into there at some point, but on that particular day, she was not there. Oh. So they had actually been together, Jim and Jean, the day before, and Robert ran into them, and allegedly the day before, he had threatened to kill Jim when he saw him next. He said, the next time I see you, 
shit's going down. Yeah. He said, I know Gene's messing around on me. I know you're the the guy and I'm literally going to kill you. He said, one of these days when you least expect it, I'm going to put a bullet through you. Oh boy. According to Jim. This is messy. It's so messy. So the next day when Jim told Robert that Gene was not hiding anywhere in his apartment, Robert did not believe him. So Robert pulls out a gun and he says, you have five seconds to produce her or I'm going to make good on my promise from yesterday. And according to Jim, that is when he personally lost it. He would later tell reporters and the police that he had a horrible temper and that as soon as Robert pulled out the gun, he, quote, knew he was going to kill him one way or the other. Okay, well, that's pretty damning. That's called malice aforethought, Yeah, Jim. it certainly is. So he later elaborated on the, on the temper thing, saying, I have a horrible temper, and it doesn't come up very often, but when it does, I just go berserk. Oh, no. I'm like, that's not good. You He's should like, talk to someone about maybe that. Maybe we should look at that self-defense thing a little harder. Yeah, yeah, probably. I'm like, you literally hurled a man over a 20-foot embankment. Was yeah. that the berserk you were referencing? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, self-defense, huh? So when he later recalled the events, uh, he he said that Robert flashed the gun, got him after Robert flashed the gun, excuse me, Jim got him in some kind of judo hold, of course. The judo holds. He loves a good judo hold. And the two of them ended up on the ground at one point and started wrestling. Now, when Jim had the upper hand, like when Robert was below him, Jim said that he used two judo chops to Robert's neck as a way to disarm him. Um, I guess that I've never wrestled a gun out of anybody's hands before, but like, why wouldn't you judo chop his arm versus anything else? Yeah. Like if you judo chop his arm, my thought is like his hand will kind of raise and like the gun will fall. Yeah, it would at least like hurt and he might loosen his grip. Right. Like, I don't know why you need to judo chop his throat, but you know, I wasn't there and I don't know how to judo chop anything. Me neither. So yeah, once Jim got the gun, he got the gun after he judo chopped him in the throat and he shot Robert in the head. Jeez. He would first say that he shot from about three feet away. He said he was like further across the room. Um, The coroner said, no, no, I disagree, sir. It was more like three inches away. Oh, close range. That is a big difference. Now, so that's what the coroner said. And then the coroner also said he couldn't determine what had actually killed Robert. Oh, it could have been the gunshot wound to the head. But it also could have been the fact that when Jim judo chopped Robert to the throat, he crushed his windpipe. Oh, my God. I have to take a deep breath just saying. I would go out on a limb and say that was probably going to be the cause of death if the gunshot wound didn't happen. That's the thing. Exactly. Damn. Crushed his windpipe. It's like that's not disarming someone. No. That's killing someone. Murdering (laughs) someone. Yeah. And here's the thing. Jim tries to say that this is self-defense. No. Which, maybe it started off that yeah. way. But then, you literally just told us, as soon as things started, you knew you were going to kill him one way or yeah, the other. Yeah, and that's not self-defense. you were pissed. Right. It's not, I knew I was going to incapacitate him, or I knew I was going to disarm him. Right. No, you said you wanted to kill him. Exactly. Come on. It doesn't make any sense to me. Come on, Jim. So his trial begins pretty quickly. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know how often this happens. I thought that juries had to be like closer to even between men and women. His uh, jury was made up of 11, 11 women and one man. Oh, wow. I That's crazy. Yeah, isn't that kind of crazy? Just like a, an interesting fun fact. Um, so he explains to this jury that his relationship with Jean was simply platonic and that mm. the murder of Robert Ingram was, in fact, you guessed it, self-defense. Oh, of course. He did admit, he said, yep, Jean and I actually did kiss on one occasion, um, which just so happened to be the one time where Robert caught us. Oh. Like, yeah, that's so coincidental, So huh? crazy. And he said that's when Robert's jealous obsession began. I would argue that, like, many people might become jealous and obsessed with you if you kiss their wives. Yeah. I don't think you should do that. Yeah, I don't think you should do that. No. No. Um, But he did tell the jury that Jean was not the type of girl to enter a love affair so callously. Oh. He said, she's not that kind of gal. No. And Jean was actually called to testify for the defense. And she told them that she and Robert had actually been separated for the last two years and that at the beginning of that separation or shortly into it, they had made the agreement to function as though they were divorced. Oh. But I'm like, "Eh, uh, that's you saying that. Yeah. I don't know. 
he's not here to say whether or not that's the case. Exactly. And he, she, according to her, Rob, Robert didn't take that separation lightly, which doesn't sound like it. No. And how could you? You know, you're that's sad. That's, that's a bummer. So she said, though, that he not only threatened to kill Jim, but mm. also he had threatened to kill her on many occasions Ooh. and any man that she ever went on to date. Ooh. She echoed Jim's same That's explanation. Possessive. That's very possessive. She echoed Jim's same explanation of their relationship. She said they were not romantically involved and that their relationship, Elena, was more of a spiritual attraction. Oh, boy. She said their conversations consisted of philosophy, religion, nature. Yeah. We just love to talk about the world, man. Oh, for sure. Peace. Which that's like, what I saw. Honestly, I feel like that's like my essence. But I was going to say, you, you love this. I do. Yeah. So moving on, though. Jim's wife actually stuck by him throughout the trial and also believed that there was, like, nothing going on between him and Jean. Okay. And mind you, they still have children at this point. So this poor woman had to go through a trial that was basically like, is this guy having an affair? And is yeah. that why he murdered this actress's fucking wife? And, Oof. oh, they did smooch once and he's going to admit it in court and you Ooh. have to sit there and hear it. This is bad. Like, that sucks. Bad news bears. That really sucks. So, yeah. like, I give her a lot of credit for sticking by him. For sure. So on July 3rd, 1963, mm. just one day before Jim's 41st birthday, he was sentenced to, uh, I don't know why, I just thought that I said sentenced wrong, but I <laughs> You did not. He was sentenced to spend one to ten years in prison after he was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Damn. So, only one to ten? It's like, isn't that insane? Jesus. Oh, just wait. Oh, God. And, you know, I really don't think his comment about making up his mind that he was going to kill Robert one way or the other didn't, you know, I don't think it helped the self-defense thing. No, I don't think thing. that helped at all. Now, even still, his lawyer, uh, Maurice Harwick, immediately filed an appeal saying that Jim hadn't received a fair trial. I don't know on what grounds he was trying to say that he didn't, because I just saw this in newspapers.com that he was like, I'm filing an appeal. Yeah, they always try. But the Honorable Kurtz Kaufman, what a fucking name. Kurtz Kaufman. Kurtz Kaufman. And it's Kurtz with a Z at the oh, end. Oh, yeah, it like, is. That's, I that's it. how I saw it in my head. Better be. He disagreed. He was like, mm, I don't think so. And like, your appeal can go fuck itself. He Bye. denied it. So... Jim gets led away to go to prison and his wife is standing there crying and she's able to give him a kiss before they take him away. And she yells after him, like, if you need me to do anything, you just call me, which is so sad. I feel really bad for her. I do, too. Now, ultimately, Jim did not end up spending that much time in jail because he did appeal his sentence again. And this time he won. I don't know on what grounds he appealed. it. I couldn't figure it out. Um, But he ended up only spending it's. Sources vary on how long he spent in jail from, or how long he spent in jail, excuse me, from one to five months. Oh, okay. But a matter of very literally nothing. It's a sneeze. It's essentially a matter of days, really, when you look at it. So Jim stayed quiet for a bit after he got out of prison, but then right around 1965, so about three, uh, two, yep, three. No, I don't know. A couple years after he got out of jail is kind of right when, like, the hippie movement was starting to become a thing. Like, it was really starting to become more mainstream. Yeah. And he meets this young hippie chick named Dora. He's 43 when they meet, and she's 19. Um, It's legal, but Jim, you're supposed to be staying out of trouble. I don't know if hooking up with a 19-year-old is the best bet for you. Yeah, I'm just going to stay over here. You have a wife and children. Yep, there's that. You probably shouldn't be hanging out with 19-year-olds. Can Uh you imagine if your 43-year-old old husband came home one day and was like, I met this 19-year-old hippie. I I didn't even say John. Like, I'm just like, imagine another alternate. Yeah, another alternate man. I could not. She's also from France, so she's like, cool. I'd be like, who's this young French girl that you're hanging out with? And yeah, I'm going to stay quiet over here about what I do. Oh, I know. <laughs> Castration. I'm, just, I'm totally kidding. So Dora was from France, like I said. She was fully immersed in the hippie lifestyle. She was doing loads of acid, smoking tons of pot, experimenting with other drugs that I don't really think people realized back then would lead to some serious fucking issues. Yeah. And looking back on the time that he met Dora, Jim said he had plenty of money because the restaurants were still doing well. But even though he had all that success and fortune, he was still absolutely miserable. He started drinking really heavily. And he said by the time he met her, he was an alcoholic who was bored of everything. Damn. But that all changed when he met her. He was like, oh, this is exciting. Like, I want to hang out with you. Now, it's unclear whether or not he was separated from his wife at this point in time. 
I don't think they were separated. And I think this might have been a big tipping point in their relationship. He's so annoying. He's the most annoying because listen, I'm all about finding yourself. Like I'm, I feel like I'm kind of finding myself a little bit right now. I'm 26 and I don't have children. That's the thing. Stop producing children and getting married if you're not sure of yourself. Yeah, you're like, you already abandoned one family and now you're on your way to abandon another. And there's children, like you just said, involved in these scenarios. Like, I feel like you're always finding yourself in some way. Right. But like he's doing it in such destructive ways and hurting everybody around him and like pulling his family that he's creating into these situations. And it's like, dude fuck off into the desert and do it by yourself but stop having kids and yeah. stop getting married like this guy's so fucking annoying i just want to like oh he gets increasingly more annoying as the story goes like, on your scowl God. is gonna turn into a, a scowl yeah i'm just like oh yeah. like every time you bring he, he just brings this 19 year old and is like yeah you're just like so much fun like right fuck off and you're for like you're God. having a, sir you're having a midlife crisis yeah like please leave you've also literally just got let out of jail for killing the second man yeah. that you've killed in your lifetime i think we should focus on the business yeah you need to like he's consistently having a midlife crisis and it's really since he was like in his 20s yeah and i'm over it now same i'm over it and you know who else is over it his damn wife good so dora and jim they start spending a lot of time together and he said he wanted to know more about these flower children and what they were all about shut up and he certainly starts finding out rather quickly so he starts remember he's an alcoholic at this point and then he starts smoking pot with dora and her friends and then he makes his way to acid And then eventually he tries and gets really, really hooked on speed. And back then, this is like even a different kind of speed because back then, I'm sure you've heard of it. There was a different form of speed, speed, excuse me, that was known on the street as black beauties. Yep. Instead of just the powder that people would inhale nasally most of the time, black beauties were a pill taken orally that would give you the same effects Ugh. or even deeper effects. Because the two main ingredients in a black beauty pill are amphetamine and dextroamphetamine, both of which are Schedule two controlled substances, meaning they are both extremely, extremely addictive yeah. and habit forming. So I guess their effect essentially creates kind of like a buzz, hence the name speed. But when they're taken long term, they can lead to some serious psychological side effects like depression, anxiety, aggressive or violent behavior, which Jim already is displaying. Yeah. And then I bolded these next couple of them. Unrealistic ideas of power, Hmm. confidence and strength. And in some cases, the psychological effects could also be hallucinations and complete psychosis. So this is just like a recipe for a cult leader. It's the recipe for a cult leader. Unrealistic ideas of power, confidence, hallucinations, and eventually complete psychosis. Like, bake for 20 minutes and let cool on the counter. Like, you know, the op- I don't know if you know it, but, like, you people, you know, like, the opening scene of the Powerpuff Girls where he's, like, sprinkling in sugar and spice and all that shit? No, but that makes sense. They were, that's what they do when they make a cauldron of cults. There you go. They sprinkle in unrealistic ideas of power, yes. fucking hallucinations, and a, a Strength, heavy dose of psychosis. confidence, yeah. All of it. I literally can't. So yeah, Jim, he was really into black beauties. And sadly, like I said, he became very addicted. And then he starts dipping into the restaurant profits to be able to afford more and more of this. And to make up for the lost money, this is wild that there's not any fucking information on this. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's not true. He would later say that to make up for the money he was dipping into from the restaurants, that he robbed between two and 11 banks between two and 11 it was about two it was kind of like 11 like could have been three could have been eight between like those are 68 and 412 vastly different numbers my dude what what i mean he was on speed so like i i guess i understand why you can't create that's, a timeline that's wild I'm also like, were there a lot of banks being robbed at this time? Yeah, like, like, was this reported? 
No. No? But nothing that I could find. Okay. Yeah. Um, he was never caught, so cool. I don't know if it's true or not, but he sure talked about it a lot, and it's one of the first things in that documentary that you'll hear. Either way, though, the investors in the restaurants were like, yeah, you need to fucking stop doing this because um, we're not making any money because yeah. you can't just keep robbing banks about it if that's even what you're doing. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, we're going to cut you out of all of this. Like, you're done. Good. You're Bye. done. You're done. You're done. And they basically pushed him out of the restaurants to save them. Good. They told they told him to fuck off into the desert. They certainly yeah. did. So Elaine would uh, go on to run the Aware Inn for the next some odd years. Good and for her. She and Jim officially divorced in 1969. Good for she her. She said, I'm going into the 70s and you're not invited. Yeah, I'm not bringing you into the 70s no, with me. No, no, no. No way. So yeah, he's literally completely like moved on now just abandons that entire family cool you're the worst yeah like even william desmond taylor only abandoned one family yeah. that, that's a joke so <laughs> that is a joke in case it was not clear a joke you've pressed an incorrect <laughs> so in the time between meeting dora and getting divorced jim dove headfirst into a life that like I've said, he seemed to be curious about since he was younger. Dora introduced him into the world of yoga, and it seems like at some point he kind of got off the hard shit. Um, I'm not sure. He definitely still smoked weed. I'm sure he did some acid about it. So, like, I don't know. He, he was doing a little bit better, but again, he abandoned another family. So yeah. how good is he really doing? But again, he's really getting into the study of different religions, uh oh! So you see where we're headed. It's, it's like normal people when you want to study that stuff. Like, sure. Yeah. This guy. I don't know. We're on a path. We are on a freaking path. And he's getting more and more into like mysticism. Like, did I say that right? Yeah. Good. Uh, <laughs> good. Good. <laughs> and he gets the itch. He's like, you know what? I've been cut out of all of these restaurants. So he gets the itch to open another restaurant. And this is the wildest story. And this is reported the same in many different sources. So I think this happened. Oh, man. So one day he meets this guy on a hike and he's talking to this guy. He's like, I got all these great ideas for this new restaurant I want to open. I have a ton of experience as a restaurant owner. You might have heard of me like for my other restaurants. And he like left out the part where he got cut out of those deals. Yeah. Um, and he said, I learned a lot over the years about cooking and about the body and how it breaks down food. And I really want to take that wisdom and open up a new restaurant that's going to incorporate the values of healthy eating, wellness, and also the secret teachings of Jesus Christ as revealed through the essence gospel or the scene gospels of peace okay um it's it's a restaurant yeah like i love a cool vibe in a restaurant yeah i love, different I love lighting um i love when the walls are a cool color i don't know if you need to think this deeply into it yeah i mean you're you're gonna have a certain clientele like you're gonna limit your clientele a yeah, little bit by you... like really only focusing on that but yeah but you know like that's on you man but go like, off jim you have not been killing it so far so this does not shock me that you are already narrowing down that customer base True. right from the jump <laughs> I think a lot of times when you're stuck in this kind of like loop of frustration, you really start to focus on problems and like everything that's going wrong instead of what you can do to fix it, aka a solution. I've been there before. I've been like, I really hate this person. I don't want to be around them. Ugh, I'm just, I hate it. Oh my God. But like, what was I going to do about it? I went to therapy. That's what I did. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem solving mode when you're faced with a challenge or multiple challenges in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's really no better feeling. And a therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it way easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small those goals are. I am a big proponent, as you all know, I say this every time I do this ad, I'm a big proponent for therapy. I think all of us should be in therapy. What inspired me to do therapy is, uh, quite frankly, some childhood trauma. And I put it off for a long time. I was like, I don't need to go. I'm just fine. Oh, my God. Looking back on who I was back then and who I am now, I feel like I'm a much more understanding person. I'm way less stressed than I used to be. And honestly, I think I approach situations with a little more confidence and, you know, tools, just tools to cope. I have so many of those. They're just laying around my house all over the place. 
I think you should give therapy a try. I think everybody should. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, it's accessible, it's affordable, and it's entirely online. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can help get you there. Visit betterhelp.com morbid today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com morbid. The thing is, I'm confused about the whole like secret teachings of Jesus Christ part of it because that really, I don't think that became a huge part of no. the restaurant at all. Well, it was a secret. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So maybe you didn't hear about it. Maybe it was like a secret ingredient. Yeah, it's like the secret teachings. You don't know about I it. I don't. I don't need to. <laughs> so, no. so this guy that he's on the hike with, just fucking shooting the shit. His name's Ray Feldman. Excuse me. He's like. I think you're the bee's knees. I think you're even the cat's pajamas. And you know what? I want to invest in your restaurant. Sounds like a great opportunity. He's like, I also want to mix chicken bolognese with the secret teachings of Jesus Christ. Don't we all? Yes. (laughs) And (laughs) my favorite part of the entire exchange is that this restaurant literally didn't even exist yet. And he's like, I want to invest in that shit. And he's like, take my money. Like, wow. Talk about a startup. Wow. So on the, I don't know if it happened on the trail or like when they made their way back down, but he just hands this man a $35,000 loan. Oh, he, this is a cult leader. Right? This is, he's a cult leader already. That's he just got thing. somebody to hand them him $35,000 $35, with just the idea of a restaurant that, that mixes food and religion. Yeah. And like wow. hippie ideals. Yeah. Like, what? And just, you know, I did the conversion. Of course. $35,000 back then. This is like 1969. Today, that would be like handing somebody $300,000. Wow. Sir, that's a lot. That's cult leader shit. That's the thing. He was said to be super, super charismatic. Yeah, he has like, to be. Obviously, charismatic. I know. I said that super <laughs> weird. So with that, the source was born. All right, the source let's go. restaurant. So the source had a very, I'm sure you're shocked to hear it, hippie feel to it. What? Um, unlike the restaurants that he'd opened with his ex-wife, the source was 100% vegetarian. Apparently the salads were really to die for. I did look at the menu and some of it looks absolutely fucking delicious. Get out of here. They had like a secret sauce too. Which yeah, I'm sure they did. I wonder what a was lot in of that secrets shit. up in here. <laughs> it's so big; it's full of secrets. Yeah, anytime there's too many secrets in a restaurant, I don't want to be a part of it. But fucking get this, dude! This restaurant, like, he's really good at opening a restaurant. I don't know what, it, like, he knows. He knows what makes people tick, and it started getting a very notable clientele. John Lennon and Yoko Ono were like obsessed with this place. They were frequent uh, flyers. Makes sense. I'm not shocked at all. <laughs> Goldie Hawn loved it there. Joni Mitchell, Marlon Brando, Greta Gabo. Wow. All these people are frequenting all this right. restaurant. It also was actually featured in the movie Annie Hall. I've never seen that oh. movie. Um, but Alvi orders at the restaurant alfalfa sprouts and mashed yeast. Oh, that's weird. Mm-mm-mm. So... The thing is, though, the celebrities were not the only people stopping by. The source really ended up being kind of like this hot spot in town for a lot of like lost younger kids in their pre and early teens to just hang out. Okay. And Jim was given jobs to the youth. The youths, excuse me. There's just something about him again, like with all cult leaders, something something about about him. him that just felt really comforting to them. And by this time, he had started dressing exclusively in like white robes from head to toe. You know? Yeah, of um, course. Of course. Like, he's a cult leader. He's been a cult leader his whole life. I'm, he very much I've is. been waiting. He was born with a robe on. I was just waiting for it to come out. <laughs> That's the thing. A lot of times, too, he'd wear, like, kind of like a really long tunic style top and, like, loose white pants. Just, you know, very yeah, you, cult leader chic. You have to dress the part. No. But I, the weird thing is, like, he, like, you you look like a cult leader, sir. But... I don't think the younger people hanging around the source really got the impression that this is what he was going to become. Though what many people say is that he became like more of a father figure to these kids because they are young and impressionable. Well, and it's good that he was fathering somebody. Yeah, not his own kids. Yeah, we'll get to that. But a lot of these kids, I think, were lacking this at home because you have to think this is like the late 60s, early 70s. 
I think during that period, most dads weren't super mushy gushy with their kids. Yeah. There was a lot of untreated PTSD going on from the war years, a lot of stress because of the general shape of the world at this point. And I think it wasn't considered manly to be home and hanging out with your kids all that yeah. time. Shitty, but that's how it kind of was. And this is exactly what you need to start a cult. It's is exactly people in a vulnerable they're going to listen. They're going to be gullible. They're going to be looking for love. They're right. going to be looking for attention. They're going to be looking for some kind of comfort. It's the perfect source. It is. <laughs> oh. And of course, I just want to note that like I'm generalizing there. I'm sure your dad from the 70s was fucking awesome. I'm okay. sure your dad fucking ruled in the 70s. I mean, my grandpa ruled in the 70s. It's true. So there's that. My dad was just like born in the 70s, I think. So <laughs> he, he was ruling. He was ruling. But all these preteens and teens, they start hanging out at the source and Jim is teaching them all about spiritualism and wellness. And he starts teaching yoga classes and the kids are just kind of not leaving. They're getting jobs there. And then they're kind of like like moving in, sleeping in the apartments above the restaurant, setting up camp outside, living and working at the source 24-7 with Jim serving as a zaddy. Wow. So around this time, again, still 1969, Jim meets another young woman and her name is Robin. And oh my God, she is absolutely fucking stunning. If Ooh, you see a picture it, of Robin. her, like... Uh, retroactively i want to be like what the fuck are you doing like, yeah you have the world at your fingertips get out of here robin and i also was just thinking when you said the source and you started talking about like preteens and everything i was yes. like what am i thinking of the boy meets world episode when john joins the center this oh, sounds exactly like that i think it's probably based i was gonna this say this loosely. is it feels like this might be based on oh my it god i need somebody to go through our episodes and listen how many times we have referenced that one specific episode oh yeah it's an it's iconic. I episode. love that episode. I also, um, which is off topic, I also recently watched the Thanksgiving episode. That'll change. That's you. a like, great one. You know, the, like the one with like where Sean's yeah. family joins Corey's family. Of course. But love the one with the center when Mr. Hunter or excuse me, when Mr. Matthews yes. pushes him against the wall. In, the best. Oh, wow. And then when I know Mr. I was, he became a zaddy. In that when moment. Mr. Feeney says you can't have Sean. I was like, oh, Mr. <laughs> oh, it's it's a lot that's a great episode it is it's that's heavy. a great episode boys meets world bo boys, boys meets, meets world <laughs> boys boy meets <laughs> world. single boy only Corey. <laughs> singular boy meets world honestly it should have been boys though because it was Corey, sean and eric yeah but it's really just it's following Corey. yes 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 but uh, i lost my train of thought <laughs> it was just a great show but anyways you're right very <laughs> very center. similar to the center. the center so he meets gorgeous gorgeous robin <laughs> and i it's honestly unclear what happens to dora i don't know if she just kind of faded off in a acid trip or like what happened but she was gone she got out of here and jim really sets his eyes on robin and he keeps telling her like you got to come by you got to take one of my yoga classes because by now again he's teaching regular night yoga classes at the source once the restaurant's like closed for the day yeah of course so robin didn't really seem interested at first and she kept brushing off the invitations and to be fair um I, jim really loves 19 year olds robin's also 19 jim needs to go away he needs to go far far away uh she's 19 years old at this point and she's like why is this like old man trying so hard to take for me to take his yoga class like this is kind of weird Ew, get out of there but finally one night she's like you know what let me just go see what this is all about like i do like the source restaurant i'll like sure i'll take a yoga class like she's into the hippie ideals and this night was friday august 8th 1969 a date that might sound familiar to some regarding another cult. Hmm. So Robin blows off plans with her friend Sharon and heads to the source to see what Jim's yoga classes are all about. Now, she loved the class. It, she thought it was awesome. And the two of them start talking after class. And they actually, it was like this sudden like switch. Like they really start to hit it off. And again, there's just something about Jim. People oh. couldn't put their finger on it, but he's got this charm. He's got this charisma. He knows how to talk. And as <clears throat> she was leaving that night, Robin was like, I kind of like, I feel like there was like a reason I was supposed to meet Jim. And the next morning, that feeling would overwhelm her entire being because the next morning, Robin's friend, Sharon, that she had canceled plans with that previous night was found murdered in her home. Wow. Sharon Tate whoa had she gone to sharon's home that night whoa she would have been killed okay when you said that date 
that popped into my head, but I wasn't thinking it was going to connect in any way. I thought it was going to be like a, oh, that happened and it made them like form more into a cult kind of yep, thing. Like yep. I had, wow. Wow. I I, wow. I tried to be like she blew up f- plans with her friend Sharon, and I could Sharon. tell I wasn't. I no, wasn't was not there. connecting. Was not. Wow. So she blew off plans that wow. night, with, and I didn't realize this in the original. I I want to actually redo the Manson episodes. I think I could do them a lot better now. Yeah, that's what we've been doing that with a couple of them, just like yeah. going further into stuff. I didn't realize the day that Saturday. So he was murdered on a Friday, technically a Saturday, because it was like in the early morning hours. The next day was supposed to be her baby shower. Oh, I had no idea. I didn't know that either. I oh, was, that's awful. I found out um, like when I was researching this part. Of oh, it, that's I was like, terrible. Awful. But Oof. so then like she's already thinking I was supposed to meet Jim and then this happens. Of course, you're going to line those two events up and be like, no, I'm, I was supposed to meet him. Well, and what a traumatic event that's going to push you further into looking for meaning somewhere. Exactly. You know? like, exactly. Here's the meaning. I was supposed to meet him. Exactly. Yeah. So everything shifted for Robin in that moment. Like you like you just said, losing a friend and coming to terms with the fact that she could have been killed. It only made her lean closer <clears throat> into Jim. Yeah. And pretty quickly, the two of them started falling in love. Now, Robin later recalled that she she said, I'd never been loved the way that Jim loved me. She called him her knight in shining armor. She recalled that he really opened up her mind. She said, he opened me up to a world that was filled with light and love and protection and consciousness. Okay. And from that day forward, the two of them became inseparable. And by 1970, they were married. That's what I say about John. I was like, he just opened me up to a, what was it? A li- Light, I always love, forget what protection, I say. Protection and consciousness. There it is. That's what I say. I always forget what I, I always say. forget what I say. I would say that Drew opened me up to light, love, protection, and consciousness too, actually. It sounds great. It's beautiful when your man's yeah, a cult leader. It's wonderful. Yeah. And the, another thing, you should watch the documentary. I don't want to like tell you everything about it. But one thing I will mention is um, Robin had been really sick in her childhood. She was like a very sickly child. And like I guess she almost died. Oh, wow. And Jim obviously gets her on this like holistic kind of venture. And, you know, that can sometimes turn things around. So she was in like the best health of her life, she felt in yeah. that moment. So I think that was like another thing that made her lean into him. Of course. Now, so they get married. And then you know, Jim loves religion and theology and all this stuff. So they start talking about that and meditation and yoga and all of it. And around this time, Jim really starts falling in love with the teachings of uh, Yogi Bhajan. So Yogi had his own following and he taught Kundalini yoga. Okay. Which was something that Jim would later use in his own teachings. Kundalini, I think, is just like all about like energy. It's like some energy that sits at the base of your spine and the yoga practice brings it throughout your body i don't know a lot about that's it. that's why you toot during yoga Me? sitting at the base of your spine and it's gotta leave you're not wrong <laughs> um never mind <laughs> you're like um parts. but yeah so they he he kind of takes that and brings it into his own teachings later on and actually robin and jim went out to meet mm. yogi as well as many other prominent spiritual leaders and they finally said to each other after meeting with all these different people potential cult leaders Uh that they want to start their own religion but they're not looking at this as like we want to start a cult they're like we want to start our own beautiful religion yeah i don't know i feel like 100 percent of the time when you say that you're looking for a cult yeah (laughs) that's just just me i i'm gonna say that jim probably was thinking of it more Mm -hmm. from a cult-like perspective i think to robin she was like a young hippie and oh yeah these are like young people that are being i'm blaming him completely she he was she was abused by him yeah he 100 percent was looking to form a cult absolutely i 100 i believe he was the only reason i said that was because i don't think robin was no i can definitely get behind that she was just kind of brought in especially in like a traumatic part of her life and 19 years old you're fucking I was a, a baby wreck. You don't at know it, but you are like at 19 years old. I was making the worst decisions of my life. Oh, like the, <laughs> I was doing things that now I look back on and I'm like, what the fuck were yeah. you doing? Like, I can see why she followed him into the dark yeah. because like I was following someone into the dark at 19. So I can totally understand yeah. that. I was a miserable human at 19. Yeah, like, same. Not not good. But him definitely was looking to start a cult when he's like freaking 47 by this point like what are you doing jim starting a cult literally so robin explained that after carefully studying each religion she and jim she said they cherry picked the best parts of separate religions and they worked them into their own philosophies like many many cult leaders do exactly to the kids who never left the source jim became their earthly spiritual father of course he did and robin became known as mother aom 
I love that. Yeah. Jim, uh, who later also became known as Father Yod or Yahoah, said of starting his own religion, I realized I had to do it on my own. I had to get my own children because I believed that he was prevailing through me. And that's what he wanted me to do. I left, never went back. Jim, you have several children. You have, I believe, three children. At least three At that least we know three. of. Yeah, there's probably more. What the fuck? I had to get my own children. Yeah, you have to get your own children. Oh my God, fuck off into the sun. Yeah. This guy can get fucked. Yeah, he does. Ew. You're going to be so happy. At, uh, no, I shouldn't say you're going to be so happy at the end, but like you're going to be like, <laughs> at the end. you're going to be like, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll make that sound. I'll make sure to do it. You should. Okay. So eventually 140 members of the source family, they become known as the source family. This yeah. Time, move into Jim's home in the Hollywood Hills. I'm not shocked by this. This 140 is 140 yeah. of them. It was a rented home from the Chandler family who were very famous for owning a ton of newspaper companies and like kind of building and developing a lot of different areas like the San Fernando Valley and the Hollywood Hills. Mm hmm. Now, Harry was the patriarch of that family, but he had died in 1944, and his wife still ran his estate. And in 1972, she rents it out to Jim Baker, or as we will now call him, Father. Father. And he paid $1,000 a month, which does not sound like a lot if you're renting a one-bedroom somewhere now that is, like, way more than that. But today, that $1,000 would be like paying $7,087 for rent. So a pretty Damn. penny. Yeah. Now, the home was massive. It was a mansion. It had been built in 1914. There were 24 rooms inside. There was a guest house outside, eight bedrooms, four bathrooms, a library, a solarium, a huge a solarium. Pool. So solarium sounds cool. I think all a solarium is is a sunroom. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It just sounds really cool. Oh, yeah. I thought it was somewhere where you looked at the stars. Yeah. I mean, you can. Cause it's it's true. Like sun cause, yeah. Just don't look at the sun. Yeah. Don't do that. No. It also had a huge pool. It had a four car garage that father used to store beautiful cars. Uh, the main one that he really loved, his, his baby car, was a white Rolls Royce. Wow. Motherfucker. I'm just a putting Rolls it out Royce. there. If you're natural, holistic, only fill my body with greens and carrot juice and give yourself unto me, your earthly spiritual father who is whipping around a Rolls Royce, <laughs> you're in a fucking cult. You are. You're in a fucking cult. Also, if you're co-living with 140 members of a quote unquote family that you're literally not actually related to in a giant house and all of you co-own all of your earthly possessions because you're not supposed to have any of your own, but father can. He doesn't subscribe to the co-owning of possessions. It's a cult. You are so totally officially a cult. Like remember in there was a UFO episode we did where it was like, you've been probed. You've been culted. You are in a cult. You're in a cult. <laughs> that's like it's just the way it is he is making you give up all your possessions but he's whipping you around in a rolls royce yeah and like maybe you think that like you co-own that rolls royce with you him don't whose name's on the title baby? yeah that's his whose name's on the title that's his rolls so the new source family they they didn't yet feel like this was a cult and they said it was just like a family of like-minded people they had a goal of spreading good throughout the world and while they were in this first house, a cult, yes. While they were in this first house, they started referring to it as the mother house. Yeah. They started talking amongst themselves while they were spending more and more time at the mother house. And this is when they decided that they really wanted to unite their ties together. And they said, what better way to become a real family than have the same last name? Yeah. So they settled on the surname Aquarian. Because it was the age of Aquarius. I was just going to say, it's the age of Aquarius. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I tried to look into like what the age of Aquarius is. And um, I felt like I was joining a cult a I little was going to say, it's... It's basically when, you know, the Manson family happens. It's very deep. It's very hard to explain. It's interesting to look into, but just don't go too far. <laughs> Be so careful. They decided, yeah, they were going to change their name to Aquarian. And many of them made their their name changes official with the Social Security office. Like they, they made this official. Wow. And all, pretty much all of them changed their own first names to things like Orbit, Electricity, <laughs> Heaven, Harvest Moon and Sunflower, etc., etc. I like Harvest Moon. I love Harvest That's Moon. That's pretty metal. I also love that song. Um, Harvest Moon Aquarian. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> 
Harvest Moon went through some shit. Yeah. So Father Yod set up a list of 10 commandments to follow, and I got them right here for you. Also, if anybody sets up a list and says these are the commandments that you are to follow, you're you're in in a a cult. cult. (laughs) One, obey and live by the teachings of your earthly spiritual father because you're in a cult. Yep. Number two, love your earthly spiritual father more than yourself because um, this is a cult. Culty cult, cult, cult. Number three, harm not one of your body parts either by neglect, food, drink, or knife. That's just just a good rule of thumb. (laughs) Allow four, allow each vibration to complete its own cycle without interference. You're in a cult. I don't even know what that means. It's culty. Number five, possess nothing you do not need and share all you have. C-U-L-T, cult. <laughs> also, I'd be like, so who, like, do I get to deem if I need it or not? No. Because I do be needing my Botox and I do be needing my car and I do be needing a lot of things. No, you don't because you're in a cult. Share all you have. Yeah. Number six, the man and his woman are one. Let nothing separate them i want you to listen to that one again number six the man and his woman are one let nothing separate them okay wonderful a union i love it maybe jim should subscribe to his own rule i was was like but (laughs) we'll get there but jim number seven squander not thy creative force and lust but come together only when three vibrations of the physical the mental and emotional are in harmony with spiritual love you're in a cult number eight each morning join your vibration with the ascending currents of the universal life energy using the keys that your earthly spiritual father has taught you because um i don't know if you've realized this yet but like you're you're in a cult Number nine, do every act energetically, intelligently, truthfully, and lovingly. That's not humanly possible. No. Number 10, when these commandments are mastered, leave the house. Leave the house of your earthly spiritual father. Get the fuck out after this. And do the work of your heavenly father. Oh, no okay you're in a cult so father also set up a morning routine that was called spiritual boot camp okay yeah everyone seem like conflicting notions but boot let's camp go. is not spiritual let's go i mean i've never done a boot camp. well i've done like an exercise boot camp and nothing about it was spiritual <laughs> well <laughs> I, I, I was like i have done like, like, actually <laughs> it's really i haven't done boot camp now everybody in the family for the spiritual boot camp would wake up at four in the morning and upon waking they were to take a deep breath ready and then they were to exhale the word yahuwah <laughs> Father told them that wow. this was God's name, Yahuwah. Yahuwah. And he was the son of God who went by the same name because he was like equally as good as God. Oh. So do that. Oh, okay. And then they were to either say aloud or in their head, just like whatever feels good to you that day. You still have like one or two choices left. Be still and know I am God. But I, but I thought the other guy was God and I thought that you were the son. So like, why do I have to wake up and say that I'm God? I, what i just like like be still i like to wake up and say where's the fucking coffee yeah i like to wake up and text elena coffee question mark yep so, i just wake up to my youngest being like can i go downstairs no she says is can it i watch stinky and dirty is and then you morning? say not yet and she's like i want to watch stinky and dirty yeah and you're like oh good morning stinky and dirty is a great show it is now once they were finished with you know their personal moments of i am god and yahuwah <laughs> They were ready for the boot camp of it all. Mm -hmm. So they would all file out into the backyard and they would get into the pool. No matter what the temperature was, you were to get into the pool because, you know, you have to rid your body of all sleep and negativity. No, I'm out already. Bye. (laughs) Bye. Once that was finished, they had to do an exercise routine that included pull-ups, dips, a little jog and um, push-ups on their fingertips. Okay. But... But why, though? Like, can anybody even do like I was just going to say, is that possible? Apparently. Wow. The routine was referred to as star exercise. And the whole point was to, quote, tune yourself into the universal energy currents of the morning. Meanwhile, the morning universe is like, what the fuck are you all doing? Like, the, the morning universe is like, I'm not doing that. And your neighbors are annoyed. Yeah. For me, like, I love a good coffee. I love a breakfast sandwich. And if I'm really feeling one with myself in the universe some morning affirmations there you go but that's really it so once the star exercises were completed they were to take one six second inhale of uh marijuana and this practice six seconds don't you feel like that's long i i know everyone always yells at me because i like know nothing about drugs like i'm the worst drug 
person ever but yeah like i don't that feels like a lot right i smoke a lot of weed and can you count yeah no yeah i haven't even gotten to six yet that's a long inhale as far as i'm concerned whenever i've talked about like smoking weed on the podcast before people are like you don't even know (laughs) anything that has to do with anything so maybe this is a very normal inhale but it feels real long it feels long to me i also had childhood asthma and i'm a little overweight so like leave me alone (laughs) but this practice and the stoner people will love this i thought this was really funny this practice was referred to as the sacred breath the sacred breath. which like agreed <laughs> so for the wow. most part everybody actually seemed really happy at the mother house like they were happy to do star exercise they were real stoked about the sacred breath yeah but people sure. i mean people said though like you wake up and you do that crazy routine and then you take this wild in my opinion inhale of weed there was one guy in the documentary that was like you don't understand like when you're in that frame of mind and then you get like high like right after that you feel like you're tripping balls oh i'm sure like he was like, like i felt like i was on lsd i didn't feel like i was high from like weed because it's like a mixture of just like adrenaline and like all the dopamine and the all the things yeah and then you're like <laughs> your body's trying to like chill out from yeah. that but it's it can't it's all different much. things just so you just start tripping around. and then you go right into like morning mm-hmm. meditation and like some crazy shit and like yeah. chanting and like all the wild it's stuff so it's it's a lot but everybody seemed happy at the mother house for the most part but there were some run-ins with the police from time to time because a lot of underage girls were on that property mm. and a lot of them had fathers and mothers that were like hey i think they're with the source family and like we're not too cool with that yeah so the police were like yeah you're gonna be in some serious hot water if this keeps happening like you gotta get you gotta send these girls home yeah like they you can't you can do what you want but you can't do what you want unless they're 18 with underage children precisely totally fine guys father has a solution it's not to tell them all that they need to go home however he just married off all the underage girls to older boys in the community so it's legal because they're married he is so gross he's fucking he's disgusting. so fucking foul he's disgusting crisis averted though am i right yeah totally so when this thing happened a couple of, or i don't know how many in general but like some of the family members were concerned that this might be a catalyst to more power moves in the future this might be a cult so guys. i think that's when people started like re- kind Dipping. of realizing but it wasn't a big awakening <clears throat> i think it was just like some people left but yeah. it was like not a very big amount so those people they were on to something because sure enough there were more power moves to be made uh what is it what is it why is it one of the first things that a cult leader does when he starts to realize all the power he has especially over the women connected to him what does he do he says plural marriage rules of course always plural marriage it's just the first thing always always so like get a new playbook honestly honestly like try something new father goes to robin or mother aom one day and he says to her you know i'm thinking of taking more wives and she's like hey what about commandment number six where like the woman and his uh the the woman and her husband are one and you should do nothing to come in between that and he was like yeah yeah you can totally i don't count i don't count i don't count i'm the earthly spiritual of course of course so she said he's sitting there talking to her about this and her what is boiling because she's like i didn't sign up for this like well that's the problem it's like if you guys went into this relationship and you were like we are going to have multiple right wives that's and husbands one whatever it is that you want to do like that's fine you just have to be it as agrees. long as you are both consenting to it and are happy and are adults and yeah everything is on the up and up on that right. situation whatever do what you want to do nobody gives a shit i mean i don't and but it's like when you enter into a marriage and then like years into it you're like i think i'm gonna marry a few more gals it's like no i didn't enter into this and if i if she's not cool with it and she's not that's not cool man then you bye because she's her whole thing she was like those were not the vows we took no we took vows to for each other yeah and so she said he's like sitting there explaining that she's getting pissed and he's like what do you think and she tells him I think you're a dirty old man on a lust trip. That's what I think. Robin. She literally said that. But she's absolutely crushed and she feels cheated and lied to. And she goes through this like really terrible period where 
she's just in front of everybody like crumbling you know yeah. like it's awful and she's trying to figure out if she should leave but she's also like i don't know where i'm gonna go how am i going to explain this to my family can i even divorce him like yeah uh, i love him i love the people here it's it's awful The average home break-in lasts between 8 and 10 minutes. That terrifies me to my very core. And that is exactly why you need a home security system that responds quickly and forcefully. For me and mine, you know, Drew and me, that's Simply Safe Home Security. At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters. They protect you with cutting-edge security technology powered by 24-7 professional monitoring agents who always have your back. And this is exactly why I love it. I don't know if you just heard my little chuckle right there, but I actually just got an alert on my phone that my camera my Simply Safe camera detected motion. You can customize your own Simply Safe, like your own whole package online. And it, I just love that it's super, super flexible. You can get as many cameras as you want for all the little crevices of your home. Did I order way more than I needed to? Absolutely. Do I check them every single night before I go to bed and feel like I rest so much easier? Yes. Because there's 24-7 professional monitoring, including myself professionally monitoring. But Simply Safe's agents call you the moment that a threat is detected and they dispatch police or first responders, whoever you need, in an emergency, even if you're not home, even if you can't be reached. Simply Safe just blankets your whole entire home in protection. There's advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. There's HD security cameras for inside and outside your home, and smarter ways to detect motion that only alert you when a threat is real, and even hazard sensors that instantly detect fires, floods, and other threats in your home. Their monitoring experts use proprietary advanced response technology to visually confirm when a break-in is real, so you can get the highest priority police dispatch. I think that's major. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash morbid. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash morbid. There is no safe like Simply Safe. <laughs> So she she stays. And eventually, father goes on to take 13 wives in total. Oh my God. 13 wives in total. And when that started happening, there was like another shift and some more people left the family because they were like, what about commandment six? Yeah, like, what the fuck, dude? So... And it's like, that is the hallmark of a cult. The hallmark. The hallmark. It's the, like suddenly. No, no, no. We haven't got to the full hallmark yet. That's like, that's like the hall. And then the mark is, because this, this, this is the thing. I'm, st I'm like so hyped that I'm stuttering. It would have been one thing if he was pairing up with women of age. Oh God. And deciding to make them his second, third, fourth, and 13th wife. He's taking on underage girls yeah, as Yeah, he's wives, a disgusting, foul he's beast. He's a pig. Yeah. And one of them in the documentary, she said when she was asked to become his wife, she was only just about to turn 17. Oh, my God. You're a 16-year-old, and I, this man's like 50 at this point. Ew. Or like in his late 40s. That's not okay. No. That's not okay. <clears throat> nope. So people were like, yeah, like, you're bringing underage girls and marrying them. Like, we're out. Ew. But there were still people that stuck around, of course. So and then father, he starts taking his wives out. He parades them around town. They're dressed. Any picture you see of them, they're all dressed like very glamorous hippies. Like, it was very Hollywood. Yeah. And they're just out spreading the good word, you know. But really, things were not going so well at the mother house, as we can very much tell now. And also because this was the time that all the Manson family trials were going on. And obviously, we know how public that was and how fucking crazy it got. Yeah. So the public gets very, very nervous about cult activity in general. And most of the neighbors close by to the Source family mother house were like, yeah, I don't really want 140 cult members living so close by because like, I do feel like I might get murdered about that. Yeah. So they start calling the landlord of the home and urging her to get them out of there. So when the lease is up at the mother house, father was told that the property was actually being sold and they were not going to be able to renew the lease. Like, you got to get out of here. Yeah. I also wonder if she said anything to him. Like, I also don't remember you adding 139 other people's names to this lease. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't about know if that, that was talked about. But now, instead of finding another mansion to live in, because remember, the Source family restaurant still exists and is doing very well by all accounts. Like, he has money. That's so wild. He's driving around a fucking Rolls Royce. I'm looking at pictures of this while you're talking. Isn't it crazy? Yeah, it's wild. So the, Sor the Source family had to move into a much smaller home at this point. This home had three bedrooms and three bathrooms, which would have been great for, like, a small family, but not very ideal for the large Source family. They moved into this house in 1973. 
only three years were spent in the original mother house and that's how much had changed oh wow so this house was named the father house and i just feel like i I don't know if i'm just in a place of deep and like reflection but isn't it so interesting how it started off with the mother house and it had Some people had this pure idea going into it of how beautiful this was going to be. And then slowly it starts to fade out and they get they can't stay at the mother house. And the next place is the father house, the father house. So when you that's the thing. And like you think about the first house being named the mother house, you think of who Robin is. Yeah. And it makes sense that things started off beautifully. Mm. And then we move on to the father house. And let me tell you, it was a steady fucking decline once they got into the father house. In the father house, the family started doing jam band sessions and father would sing. You could call it that. Um, and the boy, the band would, I played some of it. For yeah, you. you did. It's a lot. You are correct. The band would play this like really far out psychedelic music. Personally, I love the music of it. The, the singing, not so much. <laughs> um, today, their records, their recordings, excuse me, actually are like really heavily sought after by like collectors. That makes sense. And they're really hard to come by, I guess. Yeah. I, like, really want one. Like, I just want to have that. I just want it. I want it. So... Uh, the the band started like traveling together and of course father is the front man and they're going to different high schools and colleges to play their music which is a very pointed exercise i was gonna say of course you're trying to spread the message to young people to join the family and father he would do these performances and you know he's singing on stage and then like you know like the singer talks to you in the middle of it yeah he'd go into these spiels and he'd be like Come, join us, have a morning meditation, find out what the Source family is all about, Youth of America. No, thank you, It was wild. No, thank you. So he's like bringing all these people in. And all in all, they actually ended up recording over 65 albums. And I don't know if it was the music or perhaps some drug use that led to what happened next. I'm sure it maybe was a combination of the two. But around this time, father got really into sex magic. Hmm. You you did hear that correctly. Sex magic. Blood sugar sex magic. That's a Red Hot Chili Peppers album. Correct. There you go. Uh, you had to participate, though, in the sex magic ceremonies that were being held. Like, no, thank you. It was not uh what's the thing it was not a voluntary thing. yeah it was mandatory you had to go and the goal like you had like you had to go because the goal was to bring everybody's consciousness to a higher level and to quote unquote bond together on a molecular level no thank you like there's some people that i just don't want to be bonded to molecularly oh there's a uh- the whole, whole there's host a, of people that I don't want to be bonded to in any way. There's Never a mind. plethora oh, yeah. of people that I don't want to be yeah. bonded to molecularly. <laughs> they believed that after these sex magic sessions, the energy that you created during the ceremony would lead you to possessing some kind of magic afterward that you could then use in the world to probably like cultify things even more. We could just do a spin class together and create a lot of energy. It started off with morning meditation. Yeah. Like, was it wild morning meditation? For sure. For sure. But like, just... Just leave it there. Yeah. Just gather. Yeah. Vibe. But uh, don't make people do sex magic if they don't want to. Yeah. If you want to do sex magic, that's great. Have By all it. means. But like, don't make underage girls participate. No. Don't make anyone participate in any kind of that's sexual magic. Called abuse. Yeah. And actually, it's sexual abuse. So yeah. people. Oh, excuse me. I skipped a line. At this point, people really started to believe that Father was God. He oh, was boy. not the Son of God anymore. He was God Himself. <clears throat> okay. So people had left in the past, right? Like I said, this was when there was a big exit of members from the family because they were like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this alongside children. I'm good. Like this was not what I signed up for. Not at all. So they left. But again, still plenty of people that stuck around. Those who did stick around did not realize that they were nearing the end of this journey with father, the end of this earthly spiritual journey. Oh, boy. So he's going out into town, like I said, more often in his Rolls Royce with a whole slew on both arms of women all around him. This just like he's he's going out into public being like, hi, I'm a fucking cult leader. Yeah, he's like, I have this gaggle of women. Yeah. And the whispers about the family become louder and the gossip about them is spreading pretty much all around California and probably Arizona, too. And there were also still parents looking for their children who had joined the Source family. And there were so many other illegal things going on that the city was worried about. Yeah. 
It wasn't long before the police came knocking again. They were investigating kind of on the low. They were, I think they were trying to build a case to prove that this was not okay. Yeah. And they were trying to prove, prove that the family was harboring runaway juveniles. They were violating labor laws. They were keeping a place where minors were sheltered without a license. Like that's all illegal. <clears throat> and eventually child services got involved and started their own investigation because they're having children within yeah. this family now, and they don't believe in modern medicine. Ooh. Yeah. There were also building inspectors that started coming out and, and ensuring that, like, the living conditions were up to code. So father sees what's going on here. Oh, yeah. It's, it's closing in. Yeah. And for obvious reasons, he's not a fan of the sudden interest in his family. No. And he starts talking about what all cult leaders talk about when they get desperate. Say it with me. Armageddon. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the end of the world, so we're I, close. I, that's the next word, the end of times, nuclear wars between nations. It's all coming. Oh, it's all coming. Just all the things that nightmares are made of. And he decides abruptly, we're selling the restaurant. We got to get out of here. Oh, no. So the restaurant, like I said, it was doing incredibly well. Just to tell you how well it was doing, it was bringing in a reported $300,000 a year back then. Wow. I think I forgot to do the conversion on that's that okay. one. That's okay. It's a lot. Yeah, math. But he decides to sell the restaurant and he says, we're moving to Hawaii. Oh. Yes. My, my birthland. I was going to say. I really was born there. So they used the money that they got to sell the source to fund their trip to also buy a large boat. Essentially, it was like a really big boat. I don't know what classifies like a, like he got, a yacht. but it was big. And they also got um, an airplane. Whoa. Because their plan was to live off the land in Kauai and make their living as fisher people. And the airplane was so that they could spot the fish. Oh. Yeah. I don't okay. know if like every beginning fisher people. Yeah, I don't think that's how that that's done. But, route, but okay. Uh, also, they wanted to open a spa. Okay. Yeah, obviously. Yep. Yep. So the only problem is that once they got there, uh, everyone on the island was like, get the fuck out of here. We don't want this. They were here. like, do not disrupt our our and existence up here. At this point, there were already other kind of like cult-like things and people settling on the island that they didn't mm. want there. Like um Taylor Camp Ooh. had moved in on that island before and they were like, Yeah, we're done with this. Like we're not gonna keep taking it. We've had this. our fill of cults. We don't need any more. Yeah, we're we're set. They were just not into it. And nobody would hire anybody on the Source family at all. They weren't able to get jobs. And the locals were especially worried that this Manson-like family had just settled on their island. Yeah. So members of the family, they said later on that people started shooting toward the home that oh, they had damn. set up. And police were intimidating them, like tailing them wherever they went. Basically, they were trying to chase them off the yeah, island. Yeah, of course. But it's like there's kids in there. Exactly. Yeah, you got to think of that. So father was incredibly stressed about this whole thing. And he tried to defend the family by stationing men at different points throughout the camp. But there were men that had never shot guns. Yeah. before. they're like, I don't know how to do this. Like, what are you talking about? It all becomes way too much. So one day during morning meditation, there was a bowl passed around of beautiful magic mushrooms and everybody is on shrooms and they decide to go for a nature walk. Oh, no. And on this walk, father says to them. I got to tell you something. I'm not God. I don't have any power. And I don't know what the fuck we're going to do. He told them that their entire belief system that he has sold them for years is complete bullshit while they were all tripping balls on mushroom. But they were like, no, you are the earthly spiritual and he's like, father. No. And he's like, no, you got to listen I to me. I am not. I'm not. I don't I'll know what's happening. I'll show you my social security card. It does not say God. I am not God. I'm literally a man named Jim. Jim Baker. I'm Jim. Just Jim. Like, not even Jim from the office. Just Jim. I am not Jim Halpert. I am Jim. Just Jim. If wow. your name is Jim. Sorry that we just, like, did that. But, no, like, we, we love Jim. Jim's a, Jim. a wonderful name. I love the name James. I mean, come on. Yeah. So he, they're like, no, Yahweh, Father, you are God. Absolutely. And shortly after that day, there was another regularly scheduled morning meditation. This day was August 25th, 1975. It had only been about six years of this cult. And Father said to the family, I feel like going flying today. And they said, what? What he really what? meant was that he wanted to try hang gliding. 
but that was something that he had never done before. And all of his wives were like, uh, I would prefer if you didn't try to learn how to fly in the state that you're currently in. Maybe we could take a couple lessons first. Yeah. And one of the main wives at this point, I think she was kind of like the head wife, was Makushla. And she was wearing black that morning. And she said she never wore black. She usually always wore white. And when she came down for morning meditation, father told her that she was dressed appropriately. And she, Ooh. and there's a recording of this morning meditation. It's actually so haunting. The documentary, hyping up docs. Hyping it up. Hyping it up. Um, and she, so after, so he says to her like, oh, you're dressed so appropriately. And she screams in response and you can hear her scream. And she said, I don't know why I did that. It was just, there was this certain energy in the air and it was like off. And my own, that was like a release. Okay. So she was like, I don't know, something didn't feel right, but we had, we wanted to do as father said, we still thought he was the earthly spiritual father. And if he wants to climb up a mountain and hang glide off of it, then so be it. Yeah. Now looking back, everybody agreed that it was incredibly windy that day. The weather just seemed to be perfect for hang gliding. I think you need wind for that. But there was still like this weird energy in the air. And as they climb the mountain, they pass this woman who's like on a hike. She's just living her life. And father speaks in Latin to her. And in English, the translation was, we who are about to die today salute you. Oh. So they make it to the top of the mountain. And there's this huge gust of wind just as father gets launched off the side of the cliff. But as soon as that wind came, it fucking went. Oh. And he just ended up falling like... I don't even know how many, like many, 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 many feet crashed on the ground below. Oof. So everybody makes their way down to him. He's still alive. He did not die on impact. Oof. And they're like, what can we, like, what do we do? And he just keeps telling them. And uh, there is recordings of this because I forget her name. If you watch the documentary, you'll know it. But there was this one woman who was like the journalist of the, or not, the, like she she took all the pictures yeah. and like all the videos of everything. Like there's like a home birth even. But oh. just be warned, you will see the entire thing. So if you oh. don't want to see that, the it's fast forward. But he keeps telling them, transmute the pain, transmute the pain. Transmute the pain? Like, make it, like, move the, shift the energy. Yeah, like, you know? bring it somewhere Bring else. my kundalini back to normal. Yeah. So at one point, someone says, like, I think we don't really have another option. Like, we should go to the hospital. Yeah, because we don't know how to actually transmute pain. Like, no. you just fell from the sky, sir. You also literally told us that you're not God. So, like, I don't know like, what I'm supposed yeah. to do if you're not God, because I'm simply Makushla. Like, yeah, I do not know. But then, so somebody was like, I think we should go to the hospital. But like I said, hospitals and modern medicine were against their belief system. In fact, I think one of the reason, one of the main reasons why CPS had shown up was because a member had left in the past because his young son, like he was like a toddler, almost died of an ear infection because they were trying to like shine all these little different colored lights on oh him and God. stuff. But you need antibiotics for yeah that. And an infection will kill you it certainly it's just will. like the way it is they wouldn't give him medicine so that oh. his dad was like we're out uh so they were like no we can't go to the hospital they decide against the hospital visit and they all carry he fell out of the sky he straight up fell out of the sky and they're like no so they all carry father back to the house and he it's unclear some it's some sources say he like survived for like a couple more days others say only hours i saw five days and then i saw nine hours he ends up dying. And some sources say that he had no broken bones, no fractures, no nothing. He just died. Others say that he broke his back that day, which I'm going to go ahead and believe those ones. Yeah, I would his go ahead body and that. simply couldn't handle the amount of pain he was in, and he died. And wow. I'm sure, and at least in my opinion, and I think you would probably share the same belief, he probably had some internal bleeding after falling that yeah. far and that hard. And if he did have something, that an infection can happen. Yeah, you don't get it treated. It, exactly. So he he passes away, and shortly after father passes, there was this really strange phenomenon, which. It, this happened and it is kind of crazy a new star like a nova appeared in the sky over hawaii it's like literally reported on i found yeah. a newspaper article about it and the members of the family took this as a sign that father and his energy had simply shifted into that star you can believe what you want i can tell you what i believe 
a star um, happened. A star that was a born. star was born in that uh he's an asshole. Uh-huh. Who He's a murderer. Uh, he's a, like yeah, he's gross. He, and he did yeah. not turn into that wonderful star over Hawaii. That did not happen. Yeah, I don't really want to believe that uh Jim Baker is shining over my He's birth not, land so personally. you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> cuz he's not. No. I can tell you with 100% certainty. I'm here to break the news. Breaking news. Boop 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 boop. boop. Nope, it was just a star. <laughs> boop 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 not boop. Not him. Boop, boop. Not yeah, him. A star was not born. No, or it was. But it, it was wasn't Jim. So that happened, and I, I, that just like solid. Like you imagine that happening in your article, and you think all oh, this is real. So his body was later cremat, cre- cremated. cremated. His body was later cremated, and his ashes were spread along a beach in Hawaii. It literally says a beach. I'm more hoping the water. Yeah, I hope it's not actually. Can the you beach. not just like throw that in with the sand? But like, okay, <laughs> but cool. Now, the family went on to stay together for about two more years, um, and Makushla was, like, the head of the family for a while, but the, it slowly started to fade apart. Yeah. And some people actually went on to keep their Aquarian names and lived off the grid. Like, there was people at the end of the documentary that were like, I still fully believe in his teachings. I practice them to this day, and, you know, all the okay. power to them as long as you're not involving underage children. Um other people just moved on completely. There was one guy that ended up, like, founding some corporation that made him a millionaire. Oh, right. It's wild. But, you know, that's the Source family. Wow. And at the end of it, one thing is for sure. Jim Baker was one wild fucking cult leader. Yeah. Like, call it like you see it. That's a cult. He was a cult leader. Oh, yes. Fucking crazy. That was a wild ride. A wild ride. Indeed. That ended with a star being born. Isn't that crazy? And I think I had said it before to put it in your back pocket. He had broken his back previously. Yeah. So isn't that kind of crazy that that's how he died? Yeah. He was like, I was done with judo and like after that match. But then he mm-hmm. ends up going on and killing a man. And he's like with judo. It's wow. Like, maybe that I don't know. Maybe that I don't know. You know, you believed in karma, Jim. I know. That's oof. Isn't that kind of weird? Oof. Isn't that kind of weird? What am I supposed? What sound was I supposed to make? Ah! <laughs> Oh, or something I don't like remember. that. I forget what it says. People it's are yelling it at you. Yeah, they are, and I'm sorry about it. I think it was that. I think it was. Like, yeah, I'm That's supposed to make was. that sound. Cuckoo so, nuts, bananas. Wow. Yeah, we hadn't we hadn't done a cult in a while, so I figured I'd bring you a gnarly one. You know what? Your friend was 100 percent um, right when she said that you probably would have joined this family. Yeah. It's true. I would have left when things got weird in the beginning. Like, I would have left, like, probably really early on. But But you would have been there. I do love a yummy salad, and I do love, uh, like, natural, holistic ideals and meditation and stuff like that. So You love a hippie moment. I just, I do, but I also don't want to share my possessions. No. Like, with 140 I think that would be when you dip. Yeah, I'd be like, you can get fucked. (laughs) Yeah. This is mine. Don't touch it. This is mine. I'm an only child, kind of, so... (laughs) People are like, what? <laughs> I know, like, that just threw everybody into oblivion. All, is she your fucking what? cousin? Is she your sister? You're an only child, how? Don't worry and with about that, it, it's fine. We hope you keep listening. And we hope you keep it weird. weird. But that's everything you join a cult. Don't call, don't do that. Don't cult. Don't cult. <laughs> 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 <laughs>